Hello everybody and welcome to this A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough video where we're going to be taking a look at how we test for different ions, which if you study AQA is required practical for. If you want, you can download the questions first, have a go at them yourselves and then watch my video and see how we approach the answers and you can mark them as we go through. I'll be putting my thoughts down in blue as I work through this question and the answers that are going to get you the marks will be written down in green. In this first question, we're told that there is a solution Y that contains a group two metal ion and a negative ion. And we're shown that it is reacted with sulfuric acid and we make a white precipitate and magnesium nitrate and then we make a white precipitate. Just before we look at the question itself, let's just clarify that when you've got one container of a particular chemical, so let's say sulfuric acid, and we add that to an unknown solution and we get a precipitate, the identity would of course be the same as if we'd done it the other way around, because ultimately what we've got is we've got two chemicals which when they mix and react together, they produce something that is insoluble, and that's what the precipitate is. And so for the first precipitate, we've got sulfuric acid, which is also known as hydrogen sulfate, plus some unknown ion. And then in the second reaction, we've got magnesium ions and we've got nitrate ions and some unknown ion that reacts with that to make the white precipitate. And there are two parts to this question, both worth two marks. The first part is saying, suggest the identity of the group two metal present, and then write an ionic equation including state symbols for the reaction that takes place to make that white precipitate. And so you need to know that sulfuric acid, of course, contains sulfate ions. And you need to know that when you mix a metal two plus ion with sulfate ions, you get a white precipitate, particularly for barium. You might also get one for strontium. So to be honest, I think you could be allowed barium two plus or strontium two plus. And just saying barium won't be good enough. You need to say barium 2 plus or strontium 2 plus. And then for the ionic equation, I recommend when you're writing the ionic equation for the formation of a precipitate that you start actually with the product. And so when barium reacts with sulfate ions, you make the barium sulfate precipitate and that is the solid. And so the two ions that produce the barium sulfate precipitate must be the barium ions, which will be aqueous, and the sulfate ions, which will also be aqueous. And so this is made easier by the fact that we have identified the precipitate. And so we know that the barium must have come from barium ions and the sulfate from sulfate ions. And so to finish this ionic equation off, we need the charges of the ions. And since barium is a group two metal, barium will be a two plus charge. And as I've already shown here, sulfate is a two minus charge. And I think you should just remember that one. And that's how we know that the barium and the sulfate form in a one to one proportion. And then for the second question, we're asked to show the identity of the negative ion. And actually this comes from the fact that the magnesium nitrate has made us the white precipitate. And actually when the magnesium is mixed with solution Y, the white precipitate that forms will be magnesium hydroxide. And so the negative ion must be the hydroxide ion OH minus. And so the ionic equation for the formation of this precipitate, we should again start with the identity of the precipitate, magnesium hydroxide, solid, must have state symbols, we've been told about that. And then the ions that will make magnesium hydroxide will, of course, be magnesium ions, which will be two plus because it's a group two metal and hydroxide ions, which we know are one minus. Again, that's one to just remember. But because the formula of magnesium hydroxide is MgOH2, we need to have two hydroxide ions for the one magnesium ion. And then this is enough for the two marks in part A and B. This second question is quite similar to the first one, only it's coming in another direction. It's asking us what we could do to distinguish between two known chemicals and prove which was which. 
And so we're imagining a scenario where we've got two test tubes with one with potassium nitrate and the other with potassium sulfate. And we're asked what reagent that we could add to them to prove which one was which. And so the reagent that we would use clearly it needs to be something that can differentiate between nitrate and sulfate because they've both got potassium in. And as in the previous question, we know that the reagent needs to be something with barium in. Now, we can't just say barium 2 plus because that's not the name of a reagent. That's the sort of active ingredient of the chemical. So we have to say something that's got barium in. And we can say a number of things. Barium chloride is the typical one that you would use but barium hydroxide, barium nitrate, barium bromide, any other halide really, would be absolutely fine. Now what's mean for a question like this is actually you have to get the reagent correct in order to unlock the observation marks that follow on from it, because what you're doing is you're suggesting what would happen when you add barium chloride to potassium nitrate. And the answer is, well, nothing observable would happen. And so you would have no visible change. Certainly you would have no precipitate. If you choose to, you could say it would be a colourless solution, but I prefer no visible change. Whereas with the potassium sulphate, we know that barium reacts with sulphate to give a white precipitate. So that's what we would observe there. And so the one that gives a white precipitate is the one that is potassium sulphate. And then the same question, but about different chemicals. This time we've got magnesium chloride and aluminium chloride, and we're asked for a test tube test that would differentiate between them. This time they've both got chloride in, so we're differentiating between magnesium and aluminium. And so this time what we have to do is we have to use the reagent sodium hydroxide, and not hydroxide ions, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, and with the magnesium chloride, you would get a white precipitate, as we saw in the previous question, because we'd make magnesium hydroxide. With the aluminium chloride, we'd actually also make a white precipitate, but that precipitate would dissolve in excess sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So they'd both give a white precipitate, but for the aluminium chloride, you'd need to say it would also dissolve in the presence of excess potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. This final question is a different one again, and this time they're giving us a scenario where we've got three unknown solids that are all similar, so sodium carbonate, sodium fluoride, and sodium chloride, and they're all white crystals, so we wouldn't be able to tell which was which just by looking at them. And so we've been asked to outline a logical sequence of test tube reactions that, that this student could carry out to identify and prove which one was which. And then we've been told to give equations including state symbols for any reactions that take place. So this is a six mark question and we're going to be marked on the tests that we suggest, our observations that we think we would make and the equations that we think we need to show for the reactions that are happening. And so the first thing that this student would need to do is make these solids into solutions. So stage one, add water to make it into a solution. And then we'd need to just take a moment to work out how we're going to tell these apart. Well, they've all got sodium in, so we can park that idea. That won't do us any good. So what we've got in one of them is the carbonate ion, another is the fluoride ion, and another is the chloride ion. So we don't study sodium fluoride very much or the fluoride ion very much in terms of observations because it doesn't really do anything. And so what we're going to be observing then is a positive result for the carbonate ion and a positive result for the chloride ion. And then the one that doesn't do anything for either of those two tests, that will be the fluoride ion. And so we can choose which one we do first. Let's do the silver nitrate test first. That's the test for the halide ions. So you would say we're going to add silver nitrate to all three of them. And we know that only sodium chloride will do anything. Only the chloride ion will do anything and we will get a white precipitate of silver chloride forming. And so then on the remaining two, or we could do it on all three of them if we like, we could add acid to all three of them, and that would give us some fizzing in the presence of the carbonate ion. So the sodium carbonate is the one that gives us effervescence or fizzing. 
And in fact, we could actually have added acid to the solid samples. That might have worked even better, actually. And so adding acid will give us the fizzing, whether it's a solution or whether it's a solid. And so we've actually constructed the first two stages for this. We've got the method that we would use to tell these ions apart. We've got the observations that we would make both the two positives and the statement that sodium fluoride is the one that gives us no visible change on both occasions. And then in terms of the equations, well, the white precipitate is silver chloride, as I've said. And so the equation for the formation of the silver chloride precipitate is, well, start at the end. Silver chloride is this precipitate that's produced. So that will come from silver ions and chloride ions. And if you can remember that the formula for silver chloride is AgCl, and we know that chlorine is in group 7, so the chloride ion will be minus 1, that means that the silver must be plus 1. And so we've got Ag plus plus Cl minus makes AgCl. You could write it as a full equation if you wanted to, but I do think the ionic equation is much easier. If you do it as a full equation, you have to just be careful and note down that the other three chemicals are aqueous because they are the ones that aren't making the precipitate. And then the formation of the carbon dioxide, the reaction with the carbonate ions. Well, we've added sodium carbonate and let's say we've added hydrochloric acid. It doesn't matter too much. They are both aqueous and that will make us sodium chloride. We'll also make carbon dioxide and we'll also make water. So they're all aqueous except the carbon dioxide gas and the water liquid. Equally, we could write this as an ionic equation if we prefer. And remember, when you write ionic equations, anything that is aqueous splits up into its component ions. And then if something is an ion at the beginning of the reaction and it's still an ion at the end, that means it hasn't changed, which means remove it from the equation and eliminate the spectator ions, this process is called. And so what we're left with is the two non-aqueous substances don't split. So we've got CO2, gas, and H2O liquid. And what we need to include is the ions that produce these two chemicals. And so obviously the carbonate ion produces the CO2, and the hydrogen ions from the acid combine with the remaining oxygen from the carbonate ion to produce our H2O. And so for both of these equations, you could write the ionic ones, which I think is easier, or you could write the full equations. You get the same number of marks either way, but we must include the state symbols because that's what we've been told to do. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.